Helm's Deep is absolutely huge. Look at this beast. The Deeping Wall, the Hornberg Keep, the Massive Tower. This location is really coming together, but today we are elevating this massive Lord of the Rings diorama to a whole new level. We are currently missing a massive part of the castle. Right here, there should be an inner hall where the valiant defenders of Rohan can garrison within. And here, we need a massive stairwell and an upper fortification that Aragorn can spread bring back up to when the deeping wall explodes. So it begins. But most of all, we need a whole heap of rock. There is so much of that iconic cliff face that sweeps up over the fortress and down past the causeway. Today's video is going to be a monster. And because of some secret reasons you'll find out in the next video, I've got to get all that done in just one week. <laughs> Let's get crafting. Now this fortress isn't just going to be massive, but also insanely screen accurate. Last month, we prepared a whole heap of digital files that were made by Weta Workshop using the original Bigature for reference when they made their own Helm's Deep collectible. I upscaled them, and while I was working on the Deeping Wall and the Hornberg, the printers were busy churning out more prints for the back regions of the castle. Now I don't actually have these files myself, they have to remain at Weta Workshop. This part of the fortress is actually quite exciting to be working on, as it gets the least amount of screen time, and as you'll see in just a moment, Helm's Deep is actually way larger than you sort of realize in the films. The first focus for us is the rear upper battlement that looks down over the deeping wall from behind the Hornberg Tower. This features the iconic stairwell that Aragorn runs up, winding through the cliffside, and an awesome shaped battlement. With all of the prints cleaned up and primed in automotive primer, it was time to assemble the battlement that I had chopped up into bits in Blender so that it would actually fit on my print bed. I spent quite a bit of time optimizing the way this crazy shaped battlement was broken up to save on filament, which made us assembly a little tricky, but with some high strength liquid nails and bracing, we got there in the end. But our next job is a tricky one, and I know it's going to give you guys a lot of anxiety, so just hold tight. This battlement is high up amongst the cliffs behind the tower, which means there is no 3D printed components coming all the way down to the baseboard like there was for our keep. It's sort of just floating in space, so I had to build a series of support struts out of foam, and right now these are pretty touch and go, and I really Reinforce them a little bit, but look, I won't lie, if I knock this too hard, the whole thing is going to collapse. So cross your fingers for me, please, folks. This section has another little quirk too. The digital files are sculpted with a bunch of unfinished details across the piece that Leonard would then complete in his physical detailing stage of the model, and all of the brickwork texture here on this battlement is actually just for reference to map out the brick pattern, and then that got re-sculpted by Leonard, so we need to do the same. So I jumped over to the hot wire cutter and sliced up a whole heap of foam stripping, and then gave it a big old texture with foily and then began a huge process of cladding the battlement in foam stonework, cutting the foam bricks to match the reference texture on the model. I kept the grout spacing larger than I normally would to match the other texture on the rest of Helm's Deep and make sure that we've got that kind of consistent aesthetic to the digitally upscaled brickwork texture that we worked on in the last few videos. This was actually a really fun kind of classic old school foamy process using a range of different brick sizes which really built up that interest on the wall. Then for the very top, we've got the sloping battlement. Now, refoaming this would be a nightmare because of the kind of strange curved shape of those bricks, so I decided to build texture onto the plastic, first by marking out all of our grout lines, first with the razor saw, and then widening them with the Dremel. Then behind the battlement, we need our flagstone texture. This is another region that was designed digitally with no detail that Leonard retextured physically, so I cut up a whole heap of thin sheets of XPS and carved in a flag flagstone pattern by hand to match the style of the lower keep. This was just a lot of tedious ruling and carving with the scalpel, then widening with the pencil, and of course building up yet more texture with foily and bricky. Well done Zorbazorb texture team, good job. Then I glued the pieces in place behind the battlement. I'll neaten up that far side of these when the big hall is built, but on the battlement side with those pieces in place, I can now clad the inner battlement with a simple single foam block, and there we have the main foam pass done on this wall and it looks kind of dodgy at the moment doesn't it but hold on to your hats now watch how quickly this changes 
Time for a big old grouting session. Poly filler just smushed in everywhere. Now the reason we do this, as some of you who've seen the first two videos will recall, is the grout grooves on the upscaled prints are way too big because the grout detail gets exaggerated digitally so that it reads in the very small Weta Workshop collectible, or at least small compared to my builds. So I had to fill those grout lines with filler and by making my foam clad wall in a similar scale, still with these big grout lines, I've got the perfect blend of screen accuracy Accuracy, and it, it looks consistent, right? The stonework across the whole of Helm's Deep looks the same. As always, I worked back into the wet grout to make sure I wasn't losing any key details in those grout lines and wiped back the excess with a damp cloth. Shout out to my mate James for that suggestion, which he used to great effect on the Hornberg Tower in the last video. And then I set this piece aside to dry and grabbed the last batch of printed components for Helm's Deep. The next massive structure will make up the inner hall of the keep, and my goodness, you just don't get any sense of the scale of this part of the fortress in the movies. After a massive cleanup and a prime, just on the surfaces that are actually going to be visible, I slapped down all of the pieces onto a sheet of unskinned 20mm foam and traced around the footprint and began the great carving of our time. Just a huge amount of flagstones. Again, here I match that style of the outer stonework. The hall is going to be deep within the stonework, so I don't need crazy detailing, but I'm dreaming of having the cliffs removable, just like the Weta Workshop collectible has the back open to access the halls and the stables, because I want this entire diorama to be highly playable, so some nice foam flagstones are just an absolute must. Okay guys, I am having an absolute brain melt. Here we have our textured flagstones, they obviously need to drop in here where the hall is. But look at this board! It's almost the same way that way as that way. I have to cut the fortress up into maybe the whole board needs to be in four or even six. But ha if this is all cliff, that's one continuous cliff. How am I going to have a cut through here? Or do I make this as one big piece and then have a cut under the causeway? And I have to work this out before I start assembling the hall in case I need the hall to be cut in half. <sighs> My brain is melting. I've got no idea what to do. Nothing helps Creative Block like chatting out the issue with some fellow hobbyists. So when I shot one of my weekly Patreon exclusive vlogs, I put the question to my amazing Patreons and got so many incredible pieces of advice. It was all so helpful, but an extra special shout out to Chris from Ash and Stone, whose suggestion even came with a diagram in the Patreon Discord. Armed with the collective Patreon wisdom, I made the call on where to make the cut, but before I reveal that, I need to work on the inner hall. A quick coat of primer on the flagstones as this is way easier to do now before assembly and then I glued together all of the whole 3D prints and even before any interior detailing goes down how absolutely beast does the inside of this structure look? Then I started preparing some foam bracing to support the hall and quickly realised it was finally time to bite the bullet and build a proper timber foundation for the board. I knocked up a frame made from pine with a lot of reinforcing crossbar. Not only does the frame need to be strong but this also gives me more beams to fix further timber bracing to from above. And then liquid nails and screwed down some hardboard masonite panelling. Then I carefully pulled the fortress apart into its halves and slapped the timber foundation down onto the trestles. Now this is roughly a 6 by 4 foot board and as you can see I've decided to keep the fortress as one intact structure. I did realise though that part of the deeping wall actually needs to be glued onto this board so I began a completely successful process of extracting the chunk of stonework that I needed. Oh no, that wasn't the bit I was meant to cut. Not ideal. God, I really glued this. After repairing the bit I wasn't meant to split apart, I grabbed the wall with the stairs and then using that edge to kind of work out my position of the whole fortress on the 6x4 foot foundation, I glued the entire set of structures together, starting with the main castle and then attaching the various pieces. You'll notice the deeping wall doesn't go all the way to the edge of this foundation, but we'll sort that out later. 
Right, finally back to the upper hall. In the inner courtyard, I actually left out this little stairwell as I wasn't sure if this would all be glued up as one solid piece. So I glued that in and then set about installing just a whole heap of foam supports to mount that hall in place. Now, full disclosure, I stuffed up here. I should have just built specific supports from timber for this hall to begin with. But once I was kind of installing this on foam, I quickly realized I needed some lumber and I had to install some additional timber bracing mounted directly into that lower foundation. It was a bit of a kind of dodgy hassle adding these afterwards, but I've, I'm really happy now with the strength of the whole structure. Now, when making such massive scenery projects as Helm's Deep, magnetizing components can be an absolute lifesaver. All of the massive towers, and especially this blown up section of the deeping wall, are prime candidates for magnetizing. I've been magnetizing different parts of a whole range of projects for years, from all the various weapon and equipment loadouts in our Dawn of War Warhammer series, all my Horus Heresy vehicles from tanks to titans, even destructible ruins on my Osgiliath megaboard. But for such a massive project as Helm's Deep, we are going to need a lot of magnets. So I got some help from the almighty MagnaBaron.com because magnets, they just solve everything. MagnaBaron.com have just an outrageous range of magnets that are super powerful and perfect for all your wargaming and hobby needs. Every possible size and shape of of magnet you could ever want, and some really brilliant magnet sets for notoriously difficult to magnetize models, like these Imperial Knight magnet kits to quickly and easily magnetize all of your knight's important weapon options without any drilling or putty work, as well as heaps of mega handy tools like the brilliant Magnicators 2.0, which have just gone on pre-order, so you'll never glue a magnet in with the wrong polarity ever again. Con from the Magnet Baron is my longest running sponsor. He always comes through for me, so if you you guys want to support Zorpazorp and get some amazing magnets for all your hobby needs, check out magnetbaron.com, link down in the description. And now we can begin one of the trickiest parts of this entire Helm's Deep project. How do I translate the cliff work from the original Bigature and Weta Workshop's collectible into our wargaming landscape? These are massive cliffs. Now, I did a lot of fiddling off camera and worked out this kind of mocked up slope out of foam paneling. This is gonna be the skeleton or the undercarriage of our cliffs. After pinning it in place, I then glued it all together with just so much liquid nails and wooden skewers and a bucket of foam supports from underneath that you guys can't see. And then I let that fully cure before we're gonna add any plaster weight to it. Then I added the last few pieces of paneling in just to kind of butt it up against the castle walls and we're ready to start adding our cliffs. Now the cliffs themselves, just like the first section of cliff work that joins to the deeping wall, are gonna be made from plaster rock molds. Luckily my mate James came down again and we just got stuck into casting so many rocky out Croppings Between our shared collection, we have a lot of molds, so we can sort of smash out bolt casts really quickly. <laughs> now, we used a heap of these already on that first cliff, but I had a bunch left over, and I just wanted to get stuck in straight away. So I had a big play arranging them on that foam skeleton, just pinning them in place with little skewers against the foam. And then once I was happy with the rough position, I glued them all down with liquid nails. Now, when Leonard from Weta Workshop worked on the collectible, he directly referenced the original bigger when sculpting the cliff work, so it is just a phenomenal reference for these cliffs. In the actual picture, <laughs> even down got... to the actual cliffs. <laughs> and, and... <laughs> As best we can, yeah, because yeah, yeah. you can't have some sheer cliff where there was none. Now, I'm never going to be able to get it, you know, screen perfect, especially as I'm going to be changing the way some of these cliffs work to make it a more playable piece for wargaming. But I tried to capture that same sloping feel with major rock formations in all the same places, the same amount of brickwork showing through from the battlement through those outcroppings. There's even this kind of really unique terracing stonework that actually forms a little waterfall. So I've tried to capture that too, and we'll even be able to add some resin water effects up here later on. Once the molds were glued down, then it's all about modeling compound. This is a blend of plaster and cellulose fibers mixed in with water, which I just jammed into all the gaps to cover up the foam and blend the casts into one cohesive rock face. Now, on this kind of frankly insane cliff, this layer is even more important than on any other kind of cliff I've done, as I've had to leave quite a lot of negative space between these casts. But crikey, does this stuff work? So blended. I even kind of shift and change certain rock positions to get even more screen accuracy once I kind of remember just how amazing this compound is at blending all of the land forming. 
Before continuing with the rock mold cliffs, there's actually some really interesting stone detail we need to make from foam. And now I'm quite excited to tackle this part, as this is not only a region of the fortress that gets the least amount of screen time, it's almost always overlooked when people make Helm's Deep scenery for wargaming. Here is a series of stone arches that form the side of the inner keep hall. Now these are unique in that they're not brickwork and they're not kind of cliff, but they're carved from the rock itself by the Numenorean and stonemasons, so I've decided to make them from foam that is heavily weathered and textured with foily and bricky, and then build a bit of extra texture on them with polyfiller to make them look like one solid piece of rock that has been chiseled out of the mountainside. Helm's Deep is of course full of caves, so my kind of head cannon for this design of the fortress is that the inner hall would have been a big cave that was then quarried and detailed by the Numenorians, and then the fortifications grew around it, extending out from from the cliffs atop the rock, the cliff foundation of the Hornburg. With the arches in place, I added a few extra pieces of hand-carved floor tiles to cover up the area's still missing texture, and then set about adding a few internal small brickwork walls and doors. This one here matching the doorway coming off the inner battlement over the archway. I used Microforge mini slice and slot archways for the door detail and for another arch at the back of the rear battlement, which will eventually lead inside to the back of the hall and the caves beyond. Then a few extra layers of foam to bulk out the arches and that polyfiller layer I talked about to build up that texture and blend all of our pieces together. Now that our hall wall is in place, we can jump back to the cliffs. And I began the really fun task of curving the cliff up and around the battlement and over the top of those arches. This entire cliff work process is a big battle between how close I want to stick to the original bigature and how playable I want the piece to be. And I think I've struck the right balance of cliff height to capture the essence of the location, but still being able to play Warhammer on this monster diorama. I need to be able to reach the board. But we'll We'll just have to wait and see how that all works out when I play some games on this over on Zorp of the Rings, my little Lord of the Rings battle report channel, linked down in the description for that one. With those rear cliffs in place, I jumped back to modeling compound and blended like crazy. The waterfall section was a really fun challenge to get the right kind of look sloping down with so many different pieces. And of course, the curving wall arcing up and around to the hall was no simple task either, but I'm really happy with it. Then I started to build up the support structures for our next section of cliff around the Hornburg Tower and up over the front of the hall. So the rocks are looking fantastic, but I don't like doing anything the easy way, and that's why you love me. Here at the front, we've got this massive cliff face I'm about to do, but if I make this all one cohesive cliffy rock face, how the hell are we gonna get in there? Well, we're gonna build some sort of insane modular rock face, because of course we are. I want juicy gameplay in under the archway, so I've got two separate understructures. Now we need to build this cliff face so that it can pull apart as well. I have no idea how, let's find out. <laughs> Our very first statues on the Patreon honor wall. These are three of my Megazorps. Each of the Megazorps get a statue. Eric's got an elven scholar. Chrissy has Gil Gallard. And our first Space Marine, a Terminator for Rapigy, here on the Imperial Palace section of the wall. A massive thank you to all of my Patreons. All the normal Patreons will be heading up on big banners across various sections of the honor wall. And every Megazorptron gets a statue dedicated in their honor because None of this could even function without you guys. You're so important. The Megazorps get to choose from a marble finish or gold or bronze or stone. They get their name on a little plaque and banners for all of the amazing patrons. You guys are just legends. And if you viewers would like to get your name up on the Patreon honor wall, maybe even a cheeky little statue, go and check out Patreon, link down in the description. Thanks guys. I started by just having a play with my remaining pieces and seeing what could capture the iconic look of this cliff section and managed to get some really nice cliff faces, combining lots of small rocks around the lower tower and some big chonky bits on top of the hall entrance. A lot of really complicated blend Ending and carving and engineering happened off camera here, and because of the two flat cross sections of the main cliff and the removable hall entrance, we now have a really lovely looking cliff face with a fully removable section. This is going to get more challenging though in the next cliff section, as this cliff not only needs to get taller, but also wrap around down the right hand side of the keep and down to the causeway. But for now, this monster fortress of Rohan needs some paint. 
Up first is our stonework, and because the vast majority of the stone is actually foam carved this time, the first coat of primer I put down by hand, which sucked, but it keeps our beautiful foam detail all safe. I also apply this colour to the carved archways, as they won't be being painted like the cliffs, as they're not made from plaster. Before the 3D printed stairs could be primed, they actually needed one last texture pass with Tamiya putty, which I dabbed and stippled onto the plastic to abolish those layer lines and build up a more stone-like texture for our weathered steps before the front of the hall, the rear of the hall, and of course, Aragorn's precious stairwell, then they got some primer as well. Next I grabbed some alfoil and made a whole heap of precious masks for our plaster rock mold so we don't abolish that lovely plaster and applied an accent highlight with a light grey rattle can to our stonework to build up the detailed profile and then just like the last two videos jumped into the airbrushing of base tones with my three tones of grey. Now a lot of this is the same, the three varying base tones applied sort of sporadically to the whole battlement, a cool light grey, a warm mid-tone grey and a neutral dark grey, but I also applied some really splotchy passes from a distance onto the chiseled stone to build up some kind of tonal variation too in spite of the lack of brickwork. Then all those airbrush colours got a big overbrush from the top down to restore the highlight profile we built up with the rattle can. That keeps the new coloured stones in line with all of the mid-tone grey of the base prime. But before we go on to our big final layer for the stonework, the massive black wash, I actually jumped over to the rock moulds. We don't want the black wash running off the walls and onto our fresh plaster casts. To build up a hyper-realistic finish on the cliff work, I'm going to paint it with a series of layered washes using using a leopard spotting technique. This is where you flick and dab wash onto the rocks in random patterns, varying the concentration and the build of colours. My first tones to go down are a mix of pretty diluted browns, some little yellow ochre, to kind of establish those rocky undertones. It is important not to fully colour the plaster though, we do need some white showing through for our final layer, a massive black wash. This wash isn't as concentrated as the heavy black wash for the stonework, Work, but it still has some strength and it goes all over the entire cliff face, knocking back all of those undertones and tying them together, but it also stains any remaining white plaster into a nice kind of neutral grey. With the cliffs taken care of, I slathered all of the remaining stonework in heavy black wash, keeping it off the cliffs as much as I could, but making sure it built up really nicely in all of our key recesses, especially the stairs, the floor tiles, anywhere we want that grime to really sing. I cannot believe how good this looks. I, this is like Helm's Deep straight out of the movie transported to my workshop. I am freaking out. It's not finished, but my goodness, it's getting close. Before we wrap up today though, there's one big thing we have to do. First, I reorganized the trestle tables to make room for the causeway and the deeping wall and our first bit of cliff. And then I decided to add something a little special to the Hornberg Tower and the main hall. No, we're not gonna do the whole Thayer and Rave joke again. That would be extremely lame. Sorry folks, couldn't resist. So here we have Helm's Deep so far, decked out with a handful of Rohan models to give you guys a sense of scale, although I think I'm gonna need just so many more to man this absolutely massive fortress. A huge shout out to the folks at Weta Workshop for making this all possible. Leonard, Caitlin, Jules, you guys are amazing. I've got the link to the Weta Workshop web store down in the description. They have an amazing range of Middle Earth and Warhammer collectibles which are just absolute works of art and would look amazing in your hobby room. Don't forget to check out the epic new Middle Earth releases from Metalbird, link down below. Every single week from now until Christmas, I have brand new Middle Earth videos dropping right here on Zorbazorb. The next two months are gonna be bigger than the Osgiliath explosion of 2022. So come on this journey with me, like, subscribe, throw me a comment, join the Patreon if you can, and let's build Middle Earth together.